NASA's James Webb Space Telescope has just made a stunning discovery that challenges our assumptions and opens up new possibilities for the origin and evolution of these bodies, and the potential for liquid water and life beneath their crusts. Webb observed two dwarf planets in the Kuiper Belt, Eris and Makemake, and found evidence of geothermal activity within their icy surfaces. This means that they have some source of heat and energy that keeps them warm and active, despite being far away from the sun. This is the first time that isotopic molecules have been detected on the surfaces of Kuiper Belt objects, and it reveals a new source of geothermal activity and geochemical diversity in the outer solar system. In this video, we will explore how the James Webb detected methane on the surfaces of Eris and Makemake, what the methane reveals about the internal processes of these worlds, and what the implications are for the future exploration of the Kuiper Belt. So, if you are interested in learning more about this amazing discovery and how it could change our understanding of the solar system and the search for life, stay tuned and keep watching. One of the instruments that James Webb uses to measure the composition of objects is the Near Infrared Spectrograph, or NIRSPEC, which can analyze the light that is reflected or emitted by an object and split it into its different wavelengths, or colors. By doing this, it can identify the presence and abundance of different elements and molecules on the object's surface, based on their characteristic spectral signatures or fingerprints. The team used the near spec to observe two dwarf planets in the Kuiper Belt, Eris and Makemake. Kuiper Belt is a region of the solar system beyond the orbit of Neptune, where millions of icy bodies, ranging from dust grains to dwarf planets, orbit the Sun. Eris and Makemake are two of the largest and brightest objects in the Kuiper Belt, and they were discovered in 2005 and 2006, respectively. They are both about two-thirds the size of Pluto, and they have similar orbits, but they have different surface properties. Eris is covered by a thick layer of frozen methane, while Makemake has patches of methane and other ices on its surface. The team was interested in measuring the composition of the methane on the surfaces of Eris and Makemake, particularly the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen in the methane molecules. Deuterium and hydrogen are two isotopes of the same element, which means that they have the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons, in their nuclei. Deuterium has one proton and one neutron, while hydrogen has only one proton. This makes deuterium heavier and rarer than hydrogen, and it also affects the way that methane molecules vibrate and emit light. By measuring the ratio, James Webb team could infer the origin and history of the methane, and compare it with other solar system bodies. They found that the D to H ratio of the methane on the surfaces of Eris and Makemake was moderate, about 1.5 times higher than that of Earth's ocean water, and lower than that of comets and other Kuiper Belt objects. This was surprising, because it indicated that the methane was not primordial, meaning that it was not inherited from the original cloud of gas and dust that formed the solar system, but geochemical, meaning that it was produced in the deep interior of the dwarf planets by some geological or chemical processes. How can methane be produced in the deep interior of the dwarf planets? And what does it tell us about their internal structure and activity? To answer these questions, we need to understand what geochemical processes are and how they can generate methane from carbon and hydrogen in the rocky cores of the dwarf planets. Geochemical processes are the interactions between different elements and compounds in the solid, liquid, or gaseous phases under various conditions of temperature, pressure, and pH. These processes can result in the formation or transformation of different minerals and molecules, depending on the availability and reactivity of the elements and compounds involved. For example, carbon and hydrogen can combine to form methane if they are present in the right proportions and under the right conditions. But where do carbon and hydrogen come from in the rocky cores of the dwarf planets? And what are the conditions that allow them to form methane? The most likely source of carbon and hydrogen is the primordial material that was accreted by the dwarf planets when they formed, about 4.5 billion years ago. This material could have contained organic molecules, such as amino acids, sugars, and hydrocarbons, 
that were delivered by comets, asteroids, or interstellar dust. These organic molecules could have been incorporated into the rocky cores of the dwarf planets and remained there for billions of years until they were exposed to some source of heat and energy that triggered their geochemical reactions. The most plausible source of heat and energy for the geochemical reactions is geothermal activity, which is the transfer of heat from the interior of a planet to its surface by conduction, convection, or radiation. It can be caused by different factors, such as radioactive decay, tidal forces, or differentiation. Radioactive decay is the process by which unstable atoms break down and release energy and particles. Tidal forces are the gravitational interactions between a planet and its moon, or between a planet and the sun, that cause the planet to deform and stretch, generating friction and heat. Differentiation is the process by which a planet separates into different layers, according to their density and composition, releasing gravitational potential energy. Geothermal activity can provide enough heat and energy for the organic molecules in the rocky cores of the dwarf planets to undergo hydrothermal or metamorphic processes, which are the alteration of the mineralogy and structure of the rocks in the subsurface due to changes in temperature, pressure, and fluid flow. Hydrothermal processes involve the circulation of hot water or other fluids through the rocks, dissolving, transporting, and precipitating different minerals and molecules. Metamorphic processes involve the solid state transformation of the rocks without melting due to changes in temperature and pressure. Both processes can create and transport methane to the surface where it can freeze and accumulate as ice, forming the icy crusts of the dwarf planets. Why is this discovery important for the field of planetary science, and what are the implications for the future exploration of the Kuiper Belt? This discovery shows that the Kuiper Belt is more diverse and dynamic than previously thought, and that there may be more sources of geothermal activity and geochemical diversity in the outer solar system. It also suggests that there may be liquid water and organic molecules beneath the icy surfaces of some Kuiper Belt objects which are key ingredients for life as we know it. This also expands the range of possible habitats and scenarios for the origin and evolution of life in the solar system. For example, liquid water and organic molecules are essential for life as we know it, and they have been found on several worlds in the inner solar system, such as Earth, Mars, and some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. However, the outer solar system is much colder and darker, and it was assumed that the Kuiper Belt objects were too frozen and inert to harbor any signs of life. So this discovery challenges this assumption by revealing that some of the dwarf planets have warm and active interiors where liquid water and organic molecules could exist or be produced. This means that the Kuiper Belt objects could have subsurface oceans or lakes, similar to those of Enceladus or Europa, where life could have emerged or survived, or where prebiotic chemistry could have taken place. It also means that the Kuiper Belt objects could have exchanged material and information with each other, or with other solar system bodies, by impacts or collisions, potentially transferring life or its building blocks across the solar system. These questions are not easy to answer, but they are worth exploring, because they could reveal new insights into the nature and distribution of life in the universe. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, comment, share, and subscribe to my channel, and stay tuned for more videos about the wonders of the universe. See you next time.